So between now and the end of the year, string developments are going to happen that markets are not prepared for. Good morning, Simon Hunt. How are you? Uh, good evening to you. I'm fine. And yourself? I'm doing well. I just, uh, again, I want to thank you so much for your graciousness in um, coming on. So many things are going on, and my, uh, my viewers specifically requested you to get your perspective. And I want to really start with, but we're not going to end with, but let's start with the Middle East this escalation, and this is rapidly seeming to spin out of control. What is the 30,000 foot view, your 30,000 foot view on this situation right now in the Middle East? Well, you certainly start with a difficult question. Um, our take is that we're at a very pivotal, tense point. Iran recently retaliated by deliberately targeting military targets in Israel. Iran gave America and thus Israel 24 hours notice of its intention. And despite that, the missiles that were designed to hit their targets hit their targets. And those targets were primarily three of Israel's important airfields, including one that houses Israel's F-35s and F-15s. There are informed rumors that somewhere between two and four F-35s were hit, whether totally destroyed, I don't know. But there were no civilian casualties. It was a very cleverly designed operation to send a signal, which of course was ignored by the Western media and the White House and Congress, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the message was very simple. We can hit, we can e evade all your best air defenses, which includes America's, and we can hit whatever target we want in Israel. So the question really comes down, where are we going next? What Israel is doing in the Lebanon is a repeat of what they did in Gaza. They pretend that Hezbollah houses missiles in apartment blocks, etc., and they show up these beautifully designed A1 models to show where they are. That is total CRAP. Hezbollah's missiles are hidden in deep bunkers and tunnels. Only recently, like I think it was last night, that Hezbollah started firing the heavier missiles principally at Haifa, the important port. The media tells you that because Israel has decimated Hezbollah's command structure, that they've been so weakened 
that they can't operate properly. That is another mistruth. For many years, the doctrine within Hezbollah is that all commanders at all levels must train their successors and their successors. So whilst the death of Nasrullah and the commanders was a blow to Hezbollah, was not a fatal one. What we are seeing is that Israel's incursion, or should I say invasion, of another country, Lebanon, has been met with strong resistance by Hezbollah and is causing more Israeli casualties than is being reported in the press. And on, in Gaza, we can see that yesterday Hamas actually fired missiles back into Israel. West Bank is going the same way as, as Gaza. And of course, on the northern border, the 80 odd thousand people that fled the northern border uh, can't come back. The question then is, what is Israel going to do next? And to what extent will America covertly or overtly support any attack that Israel may mount on Iran? If you listen to Israeli commentators and analysts, they repeatedly say the head of the snake is Iran. So the key question is, will Israel strike at Iran? And if that does happen, will America openly or covertly support any attack. My sources indicate that an attack will come and it will come before the American elections. What sort of attack? It could easily be preceded by a cyber attack, but Iran has acquired the most sensitive electronic equipment from Russia, just as they have acquired Russia's S-400s defense missile system. So Iran is prepared for an attack and the risk is high that that attack will happen before the American elections. If that does happen, Iran has told America that either directly or through the Houthis who have also acquired Russia's latest missile missiles, that American bases in the Gulf will be attacked and that oil fields in the UAE and Saudi Arabia will be hit. So if that happens, and given that Iran has already mined the Straits of Hormuz, 
the consequences for oil prices and the global economy and the derivative markets would be immense. So we just have to wait and see what pans out. Um, but I fear that the odds are that Israel will strike Iran before the American elections. And that America, in one way or another, will support that attack. What's the, is the motivation? Uh, yeah, that's what I want to know. What is the motivation? Is it to get Iran or is it to circumvent an election or is it, um, okay, we can do this because we have America, the powers that be in America fully bought in and supportive of this? Well, the simple answer is all of the above. What's at stake for Israel is its survival. The IDF, more than the Israeli politicians, will know that Iran can destroy Israel tomorrow. Problem for Israel is again, it's their survival as a sovereign state that is now in question. For America, Israel has always been the arm to control the Middle East. From an election point of view, if you have a war, do you have an election? Some say yes, some say no. I'm not a constitutional expert. So really they're all bound together. And don't forget that the real big picture is that America wants to dismember Russia, then to control China, but that you now have a very close deed alliance between Russia, China, Iran, and even North Korea. It is those countries that want to, de amongst others, that want to develop a multi world order where no one country dominates the BRICS. Which is, in essence, yes, the BRICS. But from a, a um, strategic military standpoint, it is Russia, China, Iran versus America and her allies. That's really, those are the, the big stakes. So we should not ignore what's going on in Europe with NATO via Ukraine, well, let's put it this way. America has now got to the borders of Russia. The age long objective, at least since 1991, if not since 1946, has been to dismember Russia and gain control of Russia's natural resources. They've got so close, are they going to give up? Probably not. I mean, if we go 
what we understand is that starting sometime in the second half of 2023, NATO had already started to plan an attack on Russia, which was confirmed in early May this year when NATO met member governments in a Baltic stage and explained to them that plans had been made to attack Russia. So what we're seeing now is NATO through their Ukrainian cohorts are attacking military and oil refineries in Russia. They invaded Russia into the Kursk Oblast. They are hitting by long-range drones towns and cities right across Russia. So far, on our information, they have hit 29 military depots, oil refineries. One was a particularly big hit on a military depot at Toropets, or supposedly or rumored to have been from a by a missile launched from Latvia, where NATO was conducting exercises. What does this tell us? Tells us that these are preparatory moves for a bigger attack on Russia. It's interesting to note that Russia's ambassador to Washington completed his term of office. And normally when you are in a difficult period, the ambassador remains. But he's now back in Moscow and no successor has been announced. It's another little pointer in our view. So again, it's quite possible before the American elections, there will be an attack on Russia. This is less of a forecast, more of a high risk when you put all the dots together. So between now and the end of the year, strange developments are going to happen that markets are not prepared for. Well, let's rephrase that. Chinese leaders will know that an attack, a war somewhere, is very likely to break out soon. So they have put in place a massive reflation program. And probably followed up with a big fiscal one. So you can see what's happened to Chinese equity markets they've sold. Mm-hmm. Question you have to ask. Does China's leadership know that a war is going to break out? If they know that, then you want to make take preemptive measures to support your economy. The second question you have to ask, if war does break out, are those funds going to be trapped in China. Which leads to an even bigger question. 
if war breaks out, are some countries going to Im impose capital flow restrictions? So I'm posing more questions than answers, I'm afraid. Yeah, you are. Just, uh, but you've answered a lot of my questions already. Um, so what really stands out in my mind, the, the key thread in there, all of this, and you already answered it, it's Russia. It seems like we have, we're about to go into a two front war with Russia via through NATO engaging with Ukraine and on that side of the world, and then through the Middle East. And then really my question is then what happens with China and China's support? That's the first question, which you've already somewhat answered, but I'd still like you to address that more. And also India's involvement because India, are they even a player in this? Because they're part of BRICS and they're such a huge economy. China is doing what China always does. It operates in the background until it is forced to become directly involved. If there is an attack on Iran, given that 90 odd percent of Iran's oil goes to China, they will immediately become directly involved. Uh, you posed a question on India. I think that increasingly the, instead of being a hesitant member of BRICS, is now really throwing his hat into the BRICS ring, whilst at the same time trying to retain friendly relations with America for obvious reasons. But it's interesting that he's thrown his hat into the BRICS ring. You posed a question about what's going to happen at BRICS. They have a meeting in two weeks, right? They have the meeting, the summit starts on the 22nd of uh, this month uh, in a place called Kazan in Russia. The bigger question, before we go on to the BRICS meeting itself, is that clearly America views this summit meeting as being extremely important in that the paths towards a new currency, new BRICS currency, development of the BRICS bank, the new development bank, new members wow. joining with something like, according to rumors, 150 other nations wanting to join. America sees the maturing bricks as a real threat to their global domination. And I think they will do everything and anything to stop that from happening. So I think that War is one tool in their box. If we have a war, either or both against Russia and Iran, that is bound to disrupt, not probably postpone the meeting 
And then Washington using its toolbox to its fullest extent will persuade some existing members to break away. There is a reported attempt to stop um, Brazil from going to the Kazan summit meeting. And there are also rumors that they are playing very hard to persuade Brazil from breaking away. If the BRICS meeting does take place, from what I hear, it's very interesting that so far, and we're only a couple of weeks away from the meeting, the position vectors have not yet been agreed upon, which is usual. But if the meeting does take place, I don't think we're going to see any definitive decisions taken. I think it is much more likely that a path towards those decisions will be taken, i.e. that they will state that we are developing our new currency. It's not yet ready for launching. It will be 40% gold as an asset backing and the remaining 60 will be currency member countries but all linked back into gold. Then there's the development of the BRICS Bank, the new development bank, which they want to expand into being the BRICS equivalent of the IMF. Then there's a whole stream of investment decisions to be taken, development of different ministries, or even themed such things as education. So I think if the meeting does take place, the path to those goals will be laid out, but no definitive decisions. Okay. So let's assume that the path is laid out, that the meeting does take place. Um, it seems like gold would have to be revalued then, correct? Gold will be revalued within BRICS, yes. Uh, will it be, will America revalue gold? That will be a very interesting question. Because at the moment, America's gold, if they still have it, is valued at $42. So then that leads another question here. Gold is traded in, in New York and in London. What if it's traded at a higher value in Shanghai or Moscow or a new exchange? Um, the girl will go to where the highest bid is. Exactly right. Well, it's quite interesting. A friend of mine in here, Dubai is a big girl center. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine was with one of the gold dealers. He said, we have no gold. It's all gone. And I think what is likely to emerge, whether it's at the summit meeting, I don't know. But certainly within a couple of years, China will announce that its currency is backed by the gold 
that its citizens own, which is somewhere around 25,000 tons, which is gold that has been bought off the Shanghai Gold Exchange since its inception in 2002. More recently, like about six months ago, the PBOC set up a platform whereby households through their bank accounts can buy gold directly from the Shanghai Gold Exchange, even on a never-never basis. That's telling one a lot. Yeah. So how does the U.S. dollar survive this? And that's somewhat a rhetorical question, but I want you to answer it. And how does, I think more importantly, how does the U.S. bond market survive this? Well, first, first of all, I think with a war scenario, you're going to have a big recovery in the U.S. dollar index. Because of sneaky We will go back up to the previous high of around 107 on the, on the DXY. Okay, got it. The bond market, what is clearly going to unfold is that U.S. CPI, which understates inflation considerably, is in a bottoming out phase now. And in the second half of next year, if not earlier, you're going to see US CPI resurging. And I think given the likelihood of oil and excuse me, food supply disruptions starting to occur by around mid next year, that we are on the road by 2027 to seeing the US CPI reaching the peaks that were experienced in 1981, which from memory was 13%. What do the bond vigilantes do? 13% CPI, 4% yields on 10 year treasuries? No. They are going to be over 10%. And then what does that do to a highly leveraged system? It collapses. Yeah. I had Mark Faber on. He said you're going to see long-term yields at 20%. That's what his prediction was. Well, I won't disagree with him. I think the figure we've got is 13%. Either one of those. doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's 10, 10 or 20. A highly leveraged system can't survive on that. Oh, exactly. And the thing well, may, maybe that's when America decides, oh, we better revalue gold. Right. And actually we, we do have that 8,500 tons. I'm not saying they do. So what does that do to the balance sheet of the Fed? Well, I think we need to get to that crisis before they, they respond. Okay. Let me bring it back to all commodities and base commodities. I'm, I'm trying to remember, well, I do remember it, but I'm trying to phrase this appropriately. You are very, um, you're very op optimistic. Optimistic is the wrong word. You're very bullish, if you would, 
on precious metals and have been for quite some time. You were quite bullish on oil and that's beginning to play itself out now. And you said around after the election, we're a little early, but I think, yeah, great call. But things were unclear with you with, with commodities, I guess, base metals or even agriculture. You, do you now see a lot of upward pressure on them? Well, let, let's, so far as gold is concerned, gold is not just reflecting future inflation. It's reflecting all these war risks. Yeah. People want physical things. Go back to, I can't remember which Italian family it, it, it is, but a very old Italian family, they survived through the many wars, et cetera, over the centuries. They had title to their lands. When wars approached, they went off in their wagons, taking with them their gold and their art. And that's how they survived over the centuries. So we will see the same situation occurring uh, over the next, where are we now, 24, eight odd years. So any correction in gold is a buying opportunity. And if you don't have gold, buy now. Uh, oil, I don't have to explain. Oil, if we're half right, but by the end, uh, the ending next year, oil will be over $200. Base metals, contrary to what the bulls say, is not a function of the development of the green economy. It is a function of economic activity. Mm -hmm. So with global liquidity, without very pursue with global GDP, um, until the end of this year or early next year, base metals are heading higher. But then we are likely to see the recessionary forces taking place and political disruptions, and depending on who wins the American election, you're likely to have the opposing party not accepting the result, so you're going to have internal strife in America, which will impact business activity. So I think that the real recessionary forces will happen, plus the impact of any wars will impact business activity through the first six to nine months of next year. So with base metals reaching a new high, uh, before then, they then all collapse. Then you will have, as central banks and everybody else and governments will respond accordingly and money gets thrown into the system, credit gets thrown in, and you have what I call the last hurrah and the last dance on the dance floor. You just make sure you're not the last one on the dance floor when the music stops which will be sometime, I think, in 2027. Why 27? That's why, because that's when uh, inflation will have peaked at 13% in the, in, the, in, the in the USA, and that's when the whole system collapses. Hmm. So basically, with base metals, you just play the cycle. Right. 
It's not a long-term investment. Um, if you mind, and I, my last question is going back to Russia, can they, do they have the manpower and also the money, the resources to fight a war in Ukraine and the Middle East? Uh, the bigger question is, do they have the money to fight NATO? because that is the likely outcome it's a nato attack on russia using ukraine right do they have the resources probably yes they have the manpower yes they have increased their their military to 2.3 million people do they have the finances? Probably yes. And they are bound to be supported by China because China's leadership knows that Russia is defeated. They will be the next target. Okay. So yes, they will have the resources. That said, NATO through these different strikes have depleted a lot of Russia's stocks of armaments and stock and, and missiles. It's a huge number. Maybe a better question is, does NATO have the resources? <laughs> Uh, they think they do. Well, I um, I don't know. I just look at the U.S. military as stretched as it is, and we're broke. That's for sure. But when uh, when you're broke, what do you normally do? It's tank. You steal him. Yeah. You attack him with stealing. So Simon, I mean, there's so many black swans, anything can hit, but what's the one thing you're looking at? It can be now until the election, the US election, and now until the end of the year. What's the one or two things that, yeah, you're looking at? Well, I think the odds are high that before the election, we will have one war, if not two, One may be postponed for various reasons, i.e. Israel attacking Iran. That could be postponed until after the American elections. But the odds are very high that by the end of next year, Israel will attack Iran and Iran respond accordingly. And with the odds are high that there will be a NATO attack on Russia before the end of the year. Could those go nuclear, do you think? Sorry? Could those go nuclear? Could, but I think unlikely. Russia in Iran doesn't, don't have to go down that route. They've got hypersonic missiles, just as uh, China does. Will America respond with nuclear? I wouldn't like to answer the question. Well, we'll end on that. <laughs> Happy notes. Yeah, coffee. Yeah. Simon, um, people, they want to know, my readers ask for you and they want to know more about you. Um, they want to read your information. How do they go about doing that? Very simple, simon-hunt.com. Got it. I will put, I will link all of this in the show notes. And please, whoever's watching and listening in the last 
Last video, we got around 20,000 views. So um, please reach out to Simon if you uh, want his expertise and services. Thank you, Simon. I'd love to have you again. This is Thank you very much. I will absolutely. now go and have my breakfast. Yeah, I'm going to go to bed. And you will have your drink before going to bed. Yes. <laughs> have a good night, my friend. Yes. Good morning. Yeah.